You are listening to Dove Valley Deep Divers with Eric Trickle and Lance Sanderson. Ball comes out of the hands of Newton. It's on the ground, picked up by T.J. Ward at the four-yard line. Vaughn Miller did it again. On Overtime Media. All right, and we are live. Going to take just a second here so that I can add in our Facebook group. And there we go. And it looks like we are officially live on all of our channels. Mile high hello, everybody in Broncos country. Welcome into another episode of the Dove Valley Deep Divers podcast. I'm your host, Lance Sanderson. And joining me, as per usual, is my good buddy, my good friend and colleague, uh, Mile High Huddle Senior NFL Draft Analyst, one and only Eric Trickle. Eric, dude, preseason. Game one, week one starts tomorrow. Broncos versus Minnesota. Super hyped right now. I'm so ready for Broncos football to be back on my TV. Everything just kind of feels right in the world when football season is going, dude. How are you feeling? How are you doing? What's up, my dude? I'm tired. I'm excited <laughs> that football is finally getting back. And I'm just ready for all the preseason overreactions we're already going to get. I mean, last night I saw that Mac Jones was crowned as a Hall of Fame quarterback. So, I mean, just guess we can just turn everything else in. But uh, I'm excited ready to go and start seeing these guys that uh, you want to see growth for and from and see them out there on the field handling their business against the Minnesota Vikings, who that defense can be quite tough. I mean, first unit, second unit, these quarterbacks, these offensive lines are going to be tested. So excited to see that and see what the Broncos offense can do. Yeah, it's going to be really exciting. Honestly, I've, I've heard a lot of really good things about this Broncos offensive line, especially along the interior, uh, for, especially for the first team, uh, really regarding around what Lloyd Cushenberry has shown so far, the improvements that he's had in his functional strength. Sounds like he's finally rounding out into be a, being a high-quality center. But this Minnesota Vikings front seven, they are rough along the uh, – especially along the defensive line. I mean, you got Michael Pierce in there. You've got Dalvin Tomlinson, who's playing really well. It sounds like – I mean, Sheldon Richardson even though he's probably name value right now, really good depth there. Uh, Daniil Hunter sounds like he's having a really good, uh, really good camp as well. So it's going to be fun to see how this offensive line really holds up against you, this Minnesota defense. But also, you that, did not, you didn't even mention the best one on that defensive well, line, man. Uh, James Lynch, but ba- Baylor. James Kinsley, Lynch. There we, we go. Care. There we go. We don't, we don't care about your your draft crushes anymore. It's not draft season. This <laughs> is actually re- like legitimately football season. But uh, no, and, and, and obviously, guys, you've got the the quarterback position, the quarterback battle. Drew Locke's going to get the start going against that that uh, that that front seven for the Minnesota Vikings. So we're going to get a lot out of this. But uh, before we get into that, guys, got to get into just a few quick matters of business. You guys are watching the Dove Valley Deep Divers podcast. You guys can follow me on Twitter at Sanderson MHH and for Eric at Eric Trickle. Also, guys, while you're at it, make sure you guys are following at DVDD underscore pod. That's where you're going to find out what we're talking about every single Friday at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Also, again, guys, uh, at Mile High Huddle, that's some other account. That's where you're gonna you're gonna find, excuse me, uh, breaking news and analysis on your Denver Broncos. It's gonna be film breakdowns, opinion articles, anything news and noteworthy. You're gonna find it at Mile High Huddle. Uh, Facebook supporters, make sure you go to facebook.com slash mile high, uh, mile high huddle, click the blue, become a supporter button. That's where you're going to get premium content from uh, mile high huddle staff, including uh, the trickle zone from Eric on Saturday at noon. You also have Broncos book club with Chad Jensen and Kelderman's corner uh, on Sunday at noon. So guys, make sure you guys go and check that out. Now we have a very special guest here. We've had him on uh, one time before. Did you do the stars? I actually, I haven't done the stars yet. Let me let me get into that, guys. Yeah, uh, let me grab this really fast. So, Facebook supporters, also, uh, we're actually get ongoing with a uh, with a giveaway. I'm not sure if anyone else can see that. Uh, there's there's a there's a raffle ongoing with Facebook supporters. Uh, stars donations will actually Oops. be entered into a uh, giveaway for a Von Miller jersey. So, uh, we're having some tef- technical difficulties with that right uh, now. Chad's internet gave out. Oh, gotcha. Um, but anyways, the, the more stars you guys donate, the more chances you have to get into this raffle to win this Von Miller jersey. We're looking for 500000 We're about a third of the way there right now. So Facebook users, make sure if you want to get entered into this raffle to get this uh, this Von Miller jersey, make sure you donate your stars and, and shoot us a comment so we can actually see that you guys are donating and stuff like that. We really appreciate every single one of you guys for doing what you do because without you guys, we couldn't do what we do best, which is cover your Denver Broncos. So with- and- Go ahead, Eric. And during that, we got the the leader of it, the guy who has the most stars, and Stuart my peak jumping in, donating more stars. Stuart, thank you. We appreciate that. Your support's awesome on all the shows and everything. And you are, without a doubt, entered to win the Von Miller 
jersey that we're being, we're going to be giving away. I was going to say, I think I think Stu actually leads the and, count right now with yep. 23,000 stars donated. So we really appreciate that. Gary Leeds is another big guy in uh, in the Mile High Huddle community to donate stars as much as he possibly can. So we thank you all for that. Let's say hello to the rest of the chat really fast as well. We got uh, Steven Tobacco jumping in here, showing his support for Stu, his buddy Zeus McPeak up there. We also have Dave Glassman in here on YouTube with some with some kind emojis, uh, Broncos emojis with a with a lock symbol. I'm guessing you're a Den- uh, Drew Lock fan. A uh, Facebook user saying hello here. You have a, a permission on your Facebook uh, on your Facebook page that does not allow your name to be shown on our end. So if you go and allow all uh, all permissions for for your sharing and stuff like that, we'll be able to shout you out by name next time. So we appreciate you for joining us. Dave Griffin in the house as well. EJ in here on YouTube, Biggie Bronco. What's up, dude? George Newton. Thank you all for joining the uh, the Dove Valley Deep Divers podcast. And Tez, like I said, we always start on time on the Dove Valley Deep Divers podcast. Now, without any further ado, we have a very special guest for you guys uh, this week on the Dove Valley Deep Divers podcast. This guy has uh, shown a lot of high quality work over at milehighsports.com. Uh, he's also a co-host of the Mainly Broncos podcast. He's been on with us once before doing a mock draft, and he actually had a really good Jerry Judy piece just a couple of weeks ago. The one and only Zach Seegers. I'm going to add him in here. Zach, what's going on, dude? Hey, you're muted. Make sure you unmute Appreciate that microphone. Appreciate it. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what's up, buddy? How you doing, man? I'm doing great. How are y'all doing? Thank you so much for having me back. Yeah, not a problem, man. We enjoyed you the last time. We want to get you on more often. And quite honestly, a big reason why we wanted to get you on this week is because you actually have the opportunity, what being in Denver, being in the Boulder area, going to see you, to go out to Broncos training camp out at Dove Valley and really get some, you know, some boots on the ground perspective of what's going on at, at Broncos training camp. So uh, the, the first question I have to ask you surrounds obviously the quarterback position, that ongoing quarterback battle between Teddy, uh, Teddy Bridgewater and Drew Locke. Uh, I asked this to Ryan Edwards on Broncos Country tonight on Tuesday. If you guys get a chance, go check that out. Uh, but what kind of player are we seeing coming out of Teddy Bridgewater right now? Is he the you know the the hyper conservative guy taking all the checkdowns uh, like he was with the Carolina Panthers last season, or are we seeing a guy that's pushing the ball down the field a little bit more, taking some more chances, but still playing hyper conservatively like he was in 2019 with the New Orleans Saints? What Teddy Bridgewater are we seeing right now? Uh, in my opinion, definitely more. Panthers Teddy I think he's trying to be maybe more Saints Teddy and he's trying to uh, uh, buck the narrative that it, it has clung to him and with good reason uh, you see him trying to push things downfield occasionally but I am not seeing like Saints Teddy Bridgewater that looked like you know, the Panthers signed him with that, you know, mm-hmm. obviously they were able to get out of it, but with that contract, with the thought of him being their starter for at least, you know, like some period of time and, you know, they abandoned it because he disappointed. And I think he's kind of looking more like that version of uh, uh, Teddy. Fortunately, the Broncos have had that contract reduced. So it's, you know, less painful if he, if he plays at that level, he showed in Carolina. And even if he does show that level in Carolina, he should provide, um, some stability like Carolina Teddy is um, a heck of a lot better than like what the 2015 Broncos had at quarterback um, in, in my opinion. Uh, I guess, you know, intangibles with Peyton and, you know, getting them in the right look every single play. And, and there's certainly an argument to be made for that, but in terms of pure like post snap stuff, it's, it's not even close. Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think it's uh, not looking good, but I'm, I'm still somewhat optimistic. I'm trying to talk myself into it. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't doesn't sound very glowing. Eric, what do you think on that? Oh, well, I mean, it's like really if you wanted Teddy to 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 win the job, he needed to come in and he needed to look like the Saints Teddy. And but you also needed if you want a locked one, he needed to come in and I mean it's just a mess at the quarterback situation. Neither quarterback's running away with this, and that's just bad news for the Broncos. Yeah, it's terrible news. Speaking of news for the Broncos, before we get in, into any more of the training camp breakdown with Zach, uh, there was a very interesting quote that came out from George Payton the other day. Eric actually has an article at milehighhuddle.com um, about it, talking about how George Payton has actually received phone calls of, about other from other teams uh, inquiring about the cornerback depth of this Broncos team. And obviously we already know the, the situation. The, the cornerback depth has been bolstered tremendously by George Payton. He bring obviously bringing in Kyle Fuller, uh, Ronald Darby on a multi-year ex- extension, obviously Pat Sertan with the number nine overall pick in this last year's draft. But uh, it sounds like some teams are calling about the, uh, the cornerback depth. 
And Eric, I'm not sure if you've heard any other any names specifically, but I know in your article, I'll let you kind of take this away here. What names do the Broncos potentially have at the cornerback position that would be available for trade and what makes sense for the Broncos to do here? Well, first, I want to get uh, George Payton's full quote out there. He was asked about Patrick Sertan's versatility and the challenge of playing so many talented players in the secondary. And to this, he responded, and I quote, I think it's great. We're fortunate we have a player in Sertan that can play multiple positions at a young age. Not many rookies can play three positions. It's really a good problem to have. It's Vic Fangio's problem, but you can't have enough of those guys. Corners, a lot of them go down, so we're really happy with our depth. We have a lot of teams calling us on our depth, but we like our corners, that's for sure. And the first one I want to talk about is that the the a lot of them go down bit. Bronco fans, we are familiar with that after last year. I mean, at the point where we were signing guys to basically come in and play right away towards the end of the season is just really unheard of, really, for the most part. I mean, especially when you're having to go two or three guys to do that. And yet the Broncos defense last year still ended in 13th and DV- DVOA. That just speaks to Vic Fangio's talents as a head coach. But uh, going to this about teams calling, I mean, it's it's pre- it's preseason, it's training camp. There's no doubt that teams are constantly calling multiple. I wouldn't be surprised if corner is not the only position the Broncos have had ca- calls on. I pro- wouldn't be shocking to hear if they've had calls about wide receiver, which I know that uh, on Broncos Country Tonight, Benjamin Albright tweet, uh, made a comment about Tim Patrick, specifically with the Baltimore Ravens. Wouldn't surprise me if teams were calling about the depth on the defensive line either. But just because teams are calling doesn't mean that a trade's going to happen. But if there, if it does, there's really only two options the Broncos have that I think that could possibly be traded. That's Michael Ojemudia and Bryce Callahan. Both of them have the reasons to be traded, and both of them have the reasons that other teams just won't want to trade for them. Um, the reason why I see it just those two, I break it down in the article a little bit more. But basically, the investment of Kyle into Kyle Fuller, Ronald Darby, and Patrick Sertan takes them off the table. Like you're just not going to move off off from them ninth overall pick and then a lot of money invested in the other two just not going to happen and then the rest of the guys carrie vincent he's a draft pick but he hasn't really shown much of anything yet just any of the other guys parnell motley he struggled in camp nate harrison um rog esterman ferris he's still young i mean maybe eventually he can start receiving some calls but we just haven't seen enough out of these guys so it's bryce callahan and michael ojimudia as the only two that would make any sense for uh teams to be calling about Right. And you actually mentioned a name there that I'm really curious about. And if the Broncos do decide that they're going to move on from uh, one of these two cornerbacks in Michael Ojemudia or um, Bryce Callahan, which Bryce Callahan, that would make the most sense to me because if you can get any value in return from him, he's going to the last year of his deal. It's kind of an expensive deal. Things like six and a half million dollars. He's uh, against the cap this year. So if you can move on get some extra cap savings, maybe uh, roll that over to uh, who knows, we might be talking about Aaron Rodgers coming to the Denver Broncos here next uh, after this season. So you need all that extra. You couldn't go one season. night without mentioning Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> well, I'm just, I'm just rolling with the punches here, man. It's, it's, it, I'm not necessarily saying that uh, it's, it's going to happen, but I mean, it, it does help six and a half million dollars. That's a lot of money. And it does, it does affect the cap in a certain way. Now to back to Rojester and Ferris here, and this is going, going to Zach here. Um, with uh, with if Bryce Callahan or Michael Ojemudia was to be traded out, sounds like Rojesterman Ferris has made a, a high impact on this on this defensive coaching staff. Uh, he has a couple of interceptions, has multiple pass breakups in a short amount of time. I think he was signed on Monday. Uh, was it last week or something like that? He had I know last he had, Monday. Uh, his first practice was Monday. Yeah. So it. So Zach, what did you what did you see from Rojesterman Ferris, and what do you think of his chances of potentially making this roster? Um, I think he probably needs a trade. Maybe he sneaks in on the back end without a trade or he's a practice squad guy without a trade. Um, but yeah, he's been making plays all camp long. It's just so hard to gauge with those guys. Cause it's like, they're always around the ball and I've seen him make multiple pass breakups. I'm not as good with like memorizing the numbers on the back end of the roster guys. So when he's one of those guys where I'm always looking at the roster sheet they hand out and I'm like, Oh, who's, you know, 42 or 42 is Motley. So I think he's 43, like who's 43. And uh, it's always, you know, Redesterman Harris making a big play. Um, so I think he's got a decent chance of making the final roster, but again, it's so crowded and he was a street free agent just what two weeks ago. Yep. So um, 
it's hard to say he's got any security, but I think it's trending that way. If he plays in the preseason games, like he's been playing in camp and keeps the camp performances up, he's uh, uh, in that like Trinity Benson tier, except right. that's established because he hasn't been doing it for as long and he hasn't been with the Broncos for as long. But uh, uh, yeah, I, I really do think he's got a good shot. I will say really quick on the Callahan thing. I really hope they don't do that. I agree with everything you guys said. It makes sense in, in, a few ways, but unless you think you need that six and a half million for Aaron Rodgers, I just think it's not worth it. I think he played at a near uh, all pro level when healthy yeah, last he, year. Like he was out of his mind. I I think he's the best corner on the team still. Like I, uh, wow. yes, you can get away with trading him. I'll keep it like uh, the version of Kyle Fuller. We most recently seen Patrick Sertan's a rookie. Ronald Darby's got his fair share of question marks. Uh, I think Callahan's still the best corner on the roster. So I'd be hesitant to trade him in my opinion. See, there's one thing you said that I actually disagree with about him playing at a near all pro level. To me, he played at an all pro level yeah. last year before he got. Hurt. All right, I, I was scared. <laughs> I was scared about about uh, the comment section. What I'm glad you uh, said it because I agree. No, I, no. I agree. <laughs> I, I I do agree with you. If they do trade one, I I really wouldn't want it either one of them. I still like what Michael Ojemudi can potentially be, yeah. and I think it was last year during everything that was going on in one of the press conferences, Vic Fangio spoke often about wanting to bring Michael Ojemudia along slowly and they weren't able to do that. So I still want, I want to see what he can be if they're able to bring him along a little bit slow, um, more slowly. And they have the other pieces on in the secondary in that corner room to do that this year. So I don't want to see them give up on that. And Bryce Callahan, I would love to see what he can do, but um, you speaking about Rochester, Rochester and Ferris about possibly needing another trade. I agree with that too. I think his best bet would possibly having one of these guys traded to open up that extra space. Cause I have five Broncos. I have five corners barring a trade set to make the roster leaving a six spot open. And it's a tough battle there that Ferris is part of, but it's definitely would better his chances if there was two spots instead of one. Obviously. Yeah. If, sorry. If the Vikings are, if he's playing at these joint practices, like he was playing at the practices I saw in Denver, I bet the Vikings have him circled on like that. <laughs> you know, we, we've heard stories about, you know, pro scouts or college scouts during this time of year. They're watching all of uh, everyone's back end roster guys. I bet Regester Man Harris is, is on a, a few teams lists that are paying close attention because yeah. he's, yeah, he he's worthy of an NFL roster spot in my opinion. Good. That's uh, honestly, that, that's, that's the better for the Broncos. If they're going to have to make some difficult roster decisions, you know, and cutting some guys that are showing out and whatnot, if they're going to keep the best five guys, best six guys, if you're, if you're getting rid of a Rogester and Ferris and he, you, I mean, you don't necessarily want to have that happen. You're not, you're getting rid of high quality players, but if that's a guy that's showing out in camp consistently every single day and he still can't quite make this roster, that means that the Broncos have five or six guys that are high quality players along their defensive secondary. So I really appreciate Appreciate the, the insight from, from you there on that, Zach. I'm going to grab a couple of these comments here. Uh, Andrew Baker on Facebook donating some stars, just showing some love. Let's go Broncos. Hashtag MHH for life. We got a we got a question specifically here from Tommy Simmers on YouTube. Zach, in your opinion, is the ratio of blown sacks really as bad as it seems? It's being reported like it's two to one in Teddy's favor. Uh, I don't think so. I, I don't get that. That. Um... I, I'm going to be honest with you. I also haven't been charting sacks when I've been there. I've really been focused on kind of like either trying to do play by play or there've been practices where I'm not even looking at the quarterbacks because I'm so tired with the the debate of it all. Um, but th the ratio hasn't been that stark where it's really been noticeable to me like, whoa, you know, Teddy's getting sacked a lot more. Or, whoa, Drew's getting sacked a lot more. It seems uh, fairly even to me though. You know, if, if one's outnumbering the other, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. It now, there's one question that I want to ask you uh, on the offensive side of the ball. Kind of deals with sacks a little bit. The the battle at right tackle. Now, not being there, how it seems to me is that Bobby Massey seems to be taking a lead with Calvin Anderson not too far behind, but they have seemingly separated pretty decently away from Cameron Fleming. Having seen it, is that kind of what you've been seeing while at practices? Yeah. You know, I think I, I kind of have the feeling that I, I, my faith's in Anderson as that uh, leader in the clubhouse. Cause I think the coaching staff and Mike Munchak love him. And I think, you know, when it comes down to it, Mike Munchak's voice is going to be the one that matters the most on that decision. Um, so until we see it in preseason games and like if Massey outplays him in the preseason, then that's the way it's going to be. Um, but yeah, for, either way, I think one of those guys is, is one and the other one's one B and then yeah, Fleming, I wouldn't be surprised if Fleming doesn't make the team, especially cause like 
I've noticed Bailey making more plays and like performing better than uh, uh, Quinn Bailey. That is, um, uh, I assumed you knew, but just for um, you know, uh, <laughs> Quinn Bailey uh, looking good. Um, so I, I wouldn't be terribly surprised if Cam Fleming isn't off the team at all. I, he is not. Um, I, I don't think he's impressed anyone, especially because I think I even saw a rep or two with Moody out at tackle. I'm not positive. It's sometimes hard with like where the tight ends are yeah. and everything, but I think I might have seen a rep or two of that. That that would be interesting because his yeah. arm length is zero percentile for offensive tackles, which would just be <laughs> so such a detrimental to such a detriment to the offense. Um, but the point of, with Fleming is um, part of the issue with him, in my opinion, is that he got hurt pretty early on. If not, he was hurt when they brought him in, and he missed basically all of OTAs and mini camp, and then he missed a lot of the training camp practices too so that right there is a big reason why i agree with you that it wouldn't be surprising to me if he doesn't make it i have him still on making the roster at this point but it's simply because i want to see it from quinn bailey in games before i bump him onto the roster over fleming well and quick shout out to your boy drew himmelman over there i know that you really liked himmelman coming out of college as an undrafted free agent so there's another guy that could potentially be a, a backup tackle there i do find it noteworthy though that uh in the team's opening depth chart not that it really means a whole lot it's just kind of there for everyone to kind of really break down and, and whatnot but I, I do find it interesting that they didn't actually label a true right starter it was bobby massey or uh, Calvin Anderson, but they also had Cameron Fleming on that on the opening depth chart as the backup left tackle. So is he out of the running at the right tackle position right as of right now, or do we really do we really know yet? Uh, uh, out of the running, uh, yeah, I think he. I mean, I don't know if, if the other two guys are bad in preseason and Fleming's the best one in preseason. I don't think anything's in stone, but at this point, I'd say I'd be uh, very surprised if okay. he was the week one starter at right tackle, or really if he ever got um, the start for a reason that was an injury. Um, you know, like I don't, I don't see them benching. I mean, maybe if Massey and Anderson are bad, they'll just go through the, the roll of decks. Like uh, we've seen them do at quarterback in the past, but I don't know. I, I to me, I, like I said, I don't think Fleming's look very uh, impressive. I, I think he is a distant third behind those two. Um okay. But again, preseason games haven't even happened yet, so there's a lot of time left in that race. So yeah. things could change. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Michael Ronquillo jumping in here. Michael's been a big supporter of every single show on the Mile High Huddle, uh, the Huddle Up Podcast Network. So, Michael, we appreciate you for dropping some stars there as well. And also, got to give a shout out to our boy here, Peter Middleton, over there in Cambodia. This guy jumps jumps on every single week. From Cambodia, it's what, 5 a.m. I think it is for you over that way. So to, to come on and show some love and to also help us out by showing uh, which which uh, which people on Facebook are donating stars and whatnot. So, Peter, shout out to you for doing the Lord's work, buddy. We appreciate you on that. Um, let's see here. Maybe there might be another comment here as well. I'm not seeing anything as of right now. Uh, good evening, Michael. We appreciate that. Uh, so going back just, uh, just a little bit here to the Tim Patrick rumor that we heard, well, the report, I guess, not really rumor from, from Benjamin Albright, uh, Eric, what do you think as far as Tim Patrick is concerned, what kind of value could the Broncos get from him, from the Baltimore Ravens, if they were in fact interested in moving on from a guy that really filled in nicely for Cortland Sutton last year? I mean, he had what, 59 catches, I think on 71 targets, 72 targets, uh, zero drop passes, six touchdowns. Like this is a guy that is a, is a high quality depth receiver. You could obviously use him as a number two receiver. You could use him as an X receiver with his big body and his big catch radius. Uh, what do you think the Broncos could uh, get in return for, uh, Tim Patrick from a team that is really desperate and looking for help at the receiver position. Well, I, I saw a lot of like third round picks in, in the chat, and I think that's a little high. I think we're probably looking at like maybe a couple day three picks, a fourth and like a sixth or something like that for it. Because the the fact is, is Tim Patrick he has had a lot of injury and has has a severe injury history. Part of the reason why he went undrafted when he was coming out of Utah. And he's going to be 28 years old in November. Um, age at wide receivers is a pretty decent factor into long-term success. So it's going to be very questionable as to, while he's playing at a high level now, how much longer can he be? 
Plus, he's going to be an unrestricted free agent after this year at 28 years old, which just makes it all that more complicated to try to trade for him. So I think like maybe a fourth or a sixth, which, hey, I'll take that. Um, if we can get any more than that, I would definitely take it. And it opens up kind of like what it would do with talking about corners. It would open up a spot for some of these other guys. Trinity Benson and Kendall Hinton have been showing up a lot. Seth Williams, he kind of had, from what I heard anyways, and maybe Zach can touch on this a little bit. Seth Williams had kind of a slow start, but he's kind of started to really start to emerge over the last week and a half or so. So trading Tim Patrick, I mean, right now they have, I, in my opinion, four guys set to make it and four or five guys fighting for the last two spots. And one of them has got to be a returner, which gives an edge to Deontay Spencer. But uh, moving on from Tim Patrick, it opens up a door for one of these other guys to make it. And they may be able to get more out of them in the long run than Tim Patrick for this remaining year. Yeah. yeah. Go I, ahead, Zach. Sorry. No, I, I think that's a, a very good point. You don't want to let Tim Patrick go because I think he showed he can be a really quality number two um, wide receiver. The fact he's probably going to be a number three this year behind Judy and Sutton is an embarrassment of riches. Um, I think he is the most reliable. He's probably the only sure thing in the Broncos wide receiver room, you know, fan as yeah. a pass catcher helps, but Corlin Sutton off a, a pretty nasty ACL injury. I feel confident he'll be back and looking good. Just like I feel confident that Jerry Judy is going to improve a lot this season, but you know, neither of those things are guaranteed. Um, and then, uh, so that's my my hesitance to uh, letting Patrick go. But I'm with you. I, I want to see Tyree Cleveland develop on this roster over the next few years. And I don't want to cut him just because he's having the drops in camp. Can you imagine? I know, like, J- Judy's situation is different for a myriad of reasons. But, like, imagine if they gave up on Judy because he had drops for a short period of time. And then, like, you don't get a cash in on this awesome talent. Um, I think Tyreek Cleveland showed talent as a seventh round rookie that like he can be in the NFL for a while to come. I, I don't want to abandon him just cause he had like an injury uh, prone camp and some drops, um, you know, and I have so much talent in the receiving room. I think the same goes for Seth Williams. Like you said, slow start. He's really turned it on in that game like scrimmage they had on Sunday. I thought he looked really, really good. Um, the practice I had attended before that, which I'm trying to remember if that was Friday or Saturday, um, but he looked really good that practice as well. Um, and then Dukes. I think um, Devontrez Dukes uh, has made more, and I'm listing them in because they're that similar type that maybe they'd replace Patrick. Um, I think Dukes has been the best of that that bunch of kind of rotational X's, if you want to call them that. Uh, he's looked awesome in camp. And of course, he's a UDFA guy. You know, who knows what's going to come of that and if it's uh, going to translate to preseason football. But um, really impressive plays against his, I Like he had a 50 50 catch uh, or a catch on a 50 50 ball against Oja Mudia in the scrimmage, I believe. That was awesome. Um, so I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm starting to become a big Dukes believer and entering <laughs> camp. I, I, my money was on Mac or Jackson ahead of him and it's, it's totally flipped. Hmm. And it's funny that you mentioned Jackson because Lance here was a big Jackson fan. Don't and uh, I just got to rub it in that Jackson was, was cut a little bit, but, uh, <laughs> but don't anyways, you dare. Talk it- <laughs> don't you dare. No, no. He's lying to you, Zach, because I, I was kind of just relaying some information that I got from Ryan, Ryan in bed on Broncos country tonight saying, you know, like, he, he's making some, some flash plays and stuff like that, at least in, in OTAs and mini camps. So I was just kind of reporting at least back from what I was hearing and whatnot. So I not being out there, I was not a Warren Jackson fan regardless. He just okay. wants to bring up that I was actually like talking about him often because I mean, what, <laughs> not being there, how how am I supposed to know? All I, all I can do is just talk about the things that I'm seeing. So, okay, I, so I liked the tape, and then I saw the RAS score, and I reflected on like how he was winning on the tape, and I went, "Oh, this this is a nightmare." No, no, <laughs> <laughs> this so guy's not Ford, making it with with Jackson. Um, a lot of what came to mind when I notes repeatedly looks like Tarzan plays like Jane. I mean, yeah. dude was big, but he just didn't use his size consistently. But uh, moving on, Lance, if I really wanted to get at you, I just mentioned your thoughts on John Gruden and Mike Mayock. <laughs> but uh, the, the <laughs> thing with uh, Tim Patrick, too, that the Broncos have to weigh in is with him being an unrestricted free agent after the season, I doubt that they bring him back. 
And the simple reason for that is because I believe that provided another injury doesn't happen or something that George Payton wants Cortland Sutton back. I wouldn't be surprised if we get a deal before the season's over with Cortland Sutton and extension done. And I just can't see them with Judy and Hamler, them also bringing Patrick back with that. Yeah. So what would, would this Broncos team value more? This is what they kind of have to weigh in a potential compens- compensatory pick in 2023. That might be a third or fourth rounder, depending on what he signs for, how he mm-hmm. plays and everything. Or will they take the two, one or two picks for 2022 and get the more immediate thing. And then that could ease another team, try to help them trade for it because then they could potentially get those, that compensatory pick the following year to somewhat balance out what they gave up. So it's definitely a uh, tough situation for them. And one thing that I don't envy Peyton on, I mean, same thing with the corners. I don't envy his position on this because this is a team that they'll only go as far as the quarterback will take them. And with what we're seeing from the quarterbacks, it's not going to be very far. So it's a team that, in a way, they're in a rebuild, but not in a rebuild, and they need extra ammo to try to potentially go get a quarterback in the next couple of years. So what is is it going I'm trying to think of the way I want to put this? So I don't envy him of balancing out potential loss of injuries and having to go get one of these quarterbacks. Yeah. I'm going to yeah. grab this really fast from Dave Glassman. He has uh, some stars here. He's asking where John is at. I'm not at liberty to discuss that, and we won't get into that on uh, Dove Valley Deep Divers. We do, however, miss John being here on the stream with us. Uh, sorry about that. It, going back to Tim Patrick here, um, as far as the, the value you're going to get, and I agree with you guys, I mean, fourth to sixth round or something like that. Uh, another thing is, what's he going to get paid on the open market? And uh, Eric, you kind of alluded to it as well. Um, what what are, you know, high quality number two wide receivers getting right now on the open market? 11, 12, 13 million dollars a season? Like high end wide receivers, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Julio Jones just got 20 19, million dollars. Yeah, exactly. Like so. And also on top of that, the collective or the, not the collective bargaining agreement, but the, the new TV deals are coming in and the collective bargaining agreement, the salary cap is going to jump up massively. Is Tim Patrick in line for like a 15, 16, $17 million payout as a number two wide receiver? Like that's. I, if, if that, I, yeah. I, I think it's definitely possible. You're going to have a lot of teams with money to spend again next off season. Um, yeah. I, the more and more it'd be multiple picks for me. You've got to outweigh the the compensatory thing, especially because whatever team trades for him can like Eric was saying, easily get that pick back. Um, so I think that naturally drives uh, Tim Patrick's stock up to where it's like, I don't know if you're going to get away with just giving me a, a third round pick because I can probably get a third or a fourth compensatory pick the next season. And George Payton seems to have the job security with that six year contract where you don't feel like you need those mid round picks right now. Yeah. Um, so maybe you do feel comfortable kicking that down the road. And, and of course you can use it in a, a trade for a quarterback. So uh, yeah, I think it come down to, and I do really feel good about the talent they have behind him. So if, if I got a good enough offer um, where it, and good enough, meaning it uh, uh, outweighed the compensatory formula by enough, um, you know, then I, I absolutely jump on a trade deal as much as I love Tim Patrick. That one's easier for me to stomach than Bryce Callahan, just because again, Bryce Callahan, played it like an all pro level. Tim Patrick looked like one of the better number twos in the league. But again, this year he's your number three. Yeah. yeah and I want to grab this comment real quick. Uh, George, it's not that we're trying to be negative. If the quarterbacks were showing stuff, we'd be a lot more positive. Well, it, I, it's not all rain. It's not all rainbows, butterflies and unicorns. And we're not going to present it as such. That's not and, us. That's not our style. Really quick. I want to say I've made a point going to training camp to editorialize as little as possible. I'm trying to just say, this is what happened. And I think if you look at that game, like scrimmage where I went pretty play by play, I don't think I did all the runs and, you know, some plays where I just like missed what happened because I didn't want to talk out of my butt. Um, Wasn't sure if I can swear on this, Uh, uh, (laughs) but uh, I really didn't editorialize. Um, And I put it out there. I think it's pretty clear. And I, and Locke was good that time. And so the, what I put out there reflected that Teddy wasn't so good. What I put out there reflected it. I have no, I won't speak for them. I would be thrilled if the quarterbacks were good. Do you know how much happier my life would be? (laughs) How much happier my job would be if Drew Locke came out and looked not even like Josh Allen, like the 13th best quarterback in the league. I would be so much happier. 
all, watching all 22 yeah. wouldn't be a painful chore. I would love it. I would love it. Yeah. I wouldn't have to watch Sunday night football as escapism anymore. I'd, I'd be yeah. thrilled. Trust me. I'm not rooting for Locke to be bad. I'm, my job is to report what I see, and what I see is – maybe it's surprising Locke's not lighting the world on fire. And I don't know why it must, like the explanation has to be bias. When, when was yeah. Locke good? Why? I don't know. Whatever. And George, it, he's saying that because we want failure. I can tell you this from a business standpoint, winning sells a lot better than losing. Yep. Um, so we don't want failure. We want success uh, because success puts more money in our pockets. Like, well, from a yes, business that's, standpoint, it's that's as simple as we can be but is we it's, want it's I mean, fact. not just, not just the fandom part of us of wanting to see the Broncos win is it puts more money in our pockets when the Broncos win. We don't want failure. This right here. Hold on. I want to grab this really fast from uh jewel. The fool on, on YouTube. I love Locke. I wanted him in the top 10 and he's not showing crap. My man. And, and guess what? I was one of those guys. I said this last week on the Dove LA deep divers podcast. I said this on Broncos country tonight, just the other day. I had a, a top 15, top 20 grade on Drew Locke going into the 2019 NFL draft. I was more than comfortable with the Broncos taking him at number 10 overall. I loved Drew Locke coming out. And guess what? He has not necessarily shown the potential that I think that he has as a quarterback. He's got to get over the boneheaded mistakes. It sounds like his mechanics are a lot better from everybody that I've talked to at camp. For the most part, his footwork's better. But still, it's the it's the decision-making. It comes down to that. And we've got a guy here that has been to – Zach, have you been to every single training camp practice aside from these joint practices? or for the most No, part, I've been to about – yeah, the day 10 I think was their last – or their second last one before going to uh, joint practices. And I've been to five, um, right. five or six. So, so about you, half. Yeah. So you've been to the, uh, at least half of the practices. Let's just call it that. You've it's a been good there. count. It's a good count. <laughs> yeah. yeah but, but you've been there. You've been, uh, this is something that I wanted to get from. Uh, I mean, I live in Wyoming, dude. Eric lives in Alaska. We're not any, there's no chance of us going to, to training camp one day, let alone multiple days, we've got this guy here on our show that's telling you what he sees that's actually going on at camp. And if you think that that's negative, negative juju or just hating on whatever's happening with Drew Locke, that's, that's your own thing, man. I mean, it, and it's been multiple, multiple people have said the same thing. It, it doesn't just need me to be Zach. It, I mean, Ryan and Ben, Andrew Mason is definitely un, unhappy with the, the, the Broncos quarterback situation. Like it, it's not, <sighs> It's just crazy that that uh, people call honest analysis hatred or and disdain for something. Like I, I don't on, get it. On that, all these reporters are typically pretty in line with what they're saying. Zach, Ben, Ryan, Andrew, Mason, George, Troy, Mike—they're all pretty in line with it, saying the same thing. But it's only hate when it's Locke does something bad, and everybody hates him. Like it. And that logic, that point, doesn't add, logic doesn't add up to me. When I was doing the play-by-play, I can see the people like it and the people replying to them. And it's like touchdown from Locke. And it's like tons of likes from a, a group of people and all these comments like Locke's the man. Teddy sucks. Great play from Teddy. It's the other crowd. It's both of you guys. And everyone thinks they're, they're pure in it. But I guess here's the thing. Let's say I'm biased. Let's say I hate Drew Locke with a passion. I'm a sleeper agent. Really, my goal is to uh, mislead Broncos country into thinking Drew Locke isn't a good quarterback, when in reality, he's a marvelous quarterback. Um, and I'm I'm just, for some reason, like trying to mislead everyone into thinking he's bad. Why do all the other reports from people like Ben and Ryan, who have been huge supporters of Drew Locke, to you know people that have been critical from him from the get-go, why are they all – who's saying he's making the big leap? Who's saying he's separating himself from Bridgewater? You know, he's winning occasional practices. I don't think anyone's disagreeing there. He outperformed Bridgewater in the scrimmage I saw. Uh, I don't think anyone disagreed with that either. We're giving Locke his due when he does something good. Yeah. All we're saying is he's looking – Teddy-esque, and uh, we know what Teddy is, and uh, it's not great. It's not great. I don't know. I don't know what you want from me. And I'm not there. I'm just able to go off what information I have. And for that, I want to thank you because you, yeah, with your your scrimmage and all that stuff that you, but you definitely help us out when we're not being able to be there. And I know that you're not a big fan of the oh, which quarterback won the day and all this stuff in practices. But I mean, but it's something that I've been doing, and. 
Drew Locke leads it for. I'm not judging. I mean, the best the best thing for the Broncos, I've said this on here multiple times, is for Drew Locke to be the guy. Yep. Saying that he was bad last year isn't trying to hate on him. Doubting that he makes a step forward to where he can be a franchise quarterback isn't trying to hate on him. He hasn't shown it yet. But we but both Lance and I have said multiple times that that potential is still there. He could easily prove us wrong. And if it does, we will happily eat crow. It's the best thing for the Broncos, for be, for Bronco fans, for Locke to be the guy. He is starting to show these baby steps forward. And I, I can't remember. I think it was Clayton in chat came out and mentioned that. Is That's great. Baby steps are great. But we're reaching a point with as the Broncos in this organization, in the division, in the state of the NFL, where the baby steps, they're just not quite going to cut it much longer. Justin Herbert and Patrick Mahomes, they seem to be, in the case of Patrick Mahomes, he is, the future of the quarterback position in the NFL. Justin Herbert, last year, he showed like he can be. Maybe he had, maybe he regresses back towards the mean. Maybe he completely falls on his face. Don't know yet, so I don't want to say for sure with him yet. But when you have two quarterbacks set in the division, having baby steps from a quarterback is just not a thing if you want to be able to compete. Well, even even having Derek Carr as well. So so Derek Carr, who's a, at least an average quarterback, and everyone knows how I feel about Derek Carr. I think that he gets a lot of unwarranted hate for what he does. And don't get me wrong, he is a, a, he's a better version of, of Teddy Checkdown. Like he's going to take the the quick easy throws. He's not going to push the football down the field. But you know what? He does enough that you can win some football games with him. If you're going to have Justin Herbert and uh, and Patrick Mahomes, who have the high end upside of you know a top ten quarterback, and then a guy that's you know what 12, 14, 15, 15, something like that, that middle of the road quarterback. And then you're looking at Teddy Bridgewater and Drew Locke in the bottom 10, bottom five, even some in, in some categories. Like Drew Locke was widely considered one of the three worst quarterbacks in the NFL last season. Like, and that's what you want to try out against the number one quarterback, a top 10 quarterback, and then at least an average middle of the road Kirk Cousins style starter in this league that's shown to have a lot of success as well, especially against the Denver Broncos. Like, I, I don't know what you want from me. Yeah, I, and sorry, someone uh, – there was a question really quick like, well, why isn't the storyline that Teddy isn't separating from Locke? Because we know what Teddy is. Everyone yep. knows. Everyone knows who Teddy is. He is like the 24th best starting quarterback in the league, and like that's yep. what he is, right? That's what he will be. We've the Other people are saying, hey, he's, he's played seven, six, seven years. We know like – uh, uh, he should be better than Locke. But I think all that says is we just know what he is. We know he's – subpar and so he's like a good uh uh yardstick or like i'm trying to think of the right uh, term but like you know he's a good uh thing to measure against and uh i don't know lock lock right now he is a known commodity lock looks equal to the known commodity we can kind of figure out where lock is from that that's that's on, the thing and on the i was actually going to grab this as well from bns um asking about this uh, why why isn't it that teddy can't because Teddy is was brought in to be this the quarter the backup quarterback to compete with Locke and try to help push Locke. Everyone it is about to trying to make Locke better, not make Teddy better. We know what he is. We want to know what Locke can be. So that is why is the fact that Locke can't take this big step forward from the known commodity of being a bottom ten quarterback of the NFL. That's why that's the big deal with Locke. He can't separate from that. That's what the issue is. Knowing what the commodity is and not knowing what Locke is yet at this moment, supposedly, and not set, not seeing the separation. Like that's well, why. Simple. And, and, this, and to the people saying Locke's still improving. Sorry, last thing. To the people saying Locke's still improving. Wh- where would you say? I don't know. Roughly, Locke ranked the last six games of last season. That gave us all this optimism about a Locke improvement down the stretch. I'd say around like twenty fourth right around that bottom, uh, right around that, or border rather, between the like bottom quarter and the the third and, quarter of quarterbacks in the league. Uh, if you look at a lot of the analytics that backs up, that's right in Teddy range. He, he hasn't made a big leap over the offseason. He's about where he was at the end of last season, right and in the Teddy one more, range. And one more, better, have we, one more point I have before we <laughs> got to move back, move off of this, is he's got 18 starts. Evan Love comes in, he says he's got 18 starts. Fun fact about this, and there was actually a big study done with this, what you see in quarterbacks over their first 16 games is typically what you get over their career. Very rare, very rare occasions. Is that not the case? It was the case with Josh Allen. This big leap he yep. made really wasn't this big leap. It was steady progression that he made over the first 16 games that he managed to continue on. 
The only exception that I can think of off the top of my head was Blake Bortles, who actually looked really good early on and fell flat. Yep. So I, I was listening to the radio station, and Zach, you're going to hate me for this, but I was listening to a, a radio station there in Denver. Ooh. And uh, yeah, I know. I know. I know how you feel about them. Uh, but there's actually a good point here, and it goes back to Eric's point about uh, the, the jump that, Drew, or that uh, Josh Allen took this last season where he was, you know, at the bottom of the league in terms of completion percentage. And then the very next season went to the very top of the league in completion percentage. And I think over the last 25 seasons, as far as back as this guy went, no quarterback has ever been able to do that ever. This is a historical jump. Literally, Josh Allen made a historical leap from, uh, you know, what, 24, 25 about is where he was at in 2019, 2020, something like that. And then he went to a top three quarterback in the NFL in terms of so, completion percentage. That is not yeah, that's, something you're going to see very often, guys. That's just looking at what he's doing as a passer. And yeah. I think that if you are sitting there and you're not going to talk about what Josh Allen was able to bring as a as a runner, the first thing is you're just doing a complete disservice and being completely intellectually dishonest about anything and just showing that you don't want to have the full conversation about Josh Allen and Drew Locke when you make this comparison because Drew Locke can't even hold Josh Allen's jock straps when it comes to his ability as a runner. And we all we all would take Locke. We're all rooting for Locke over Teddy. Like we said, yeah. Teddy was yeah. brought in to be the backup, but – I don't know. Dude's not looking good at camp. I, if he was balling out, I would report it. I would, I'd would. i have some awesome clips to post if that was the case. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what you want. Well, so it, let, let me just drop this last thing. I, I put this out on my Twitter account. Um, I think it was not last Thursday. I think it was last Thursday. And it was. it got a lot of run. There was a lot of conversation on multiple radio stations in Denver about it and everything. And it was, you know, if – if Drew Locke has taken this massive step forward as a quarterback, shouldn't we be seeing that in practice? Like, should we be able to see that he's actually taking these steps to becoming a legitimate franchise quarterback? Yeah, I, I get it. It's a week worth of practice and it's not always, we don't exactly know what's going on behind the scenes, what they're actually being tasked to do. But if Drew Locke is making these steps as a, a legitimate franchise quarterback, you would be able to notice that. I mean, even Kirk Cousins in in uh, in Minnesota, Derek Carr in in Las Vegas, a middle of the road quarterback, Kyler Murray. When you watch those guys in practice, you know that's the guy. That is the quarterback that is running this team. That, like, there's no close. It's like it's a far. I'm separation sorry, I'm going to interrupt you, George. Backup. Careful, you're on the close to being. You're close to being blocked. Careful, George. Yeah, easy on that. That's that's like nice. I'm saying that we're hating. Yeah, that's just a no go for me. Uh, Your first and, and only warning. Uh, regardless, like when, like, does Aaron Rodgers have? Uh, now this is not fair, but Aaron Rodgers, when he's out there practicing, does Jordan Love show anything close to that? No, Aaron Rodgers is the guy. Going back to Kyler Murray, Kyler Murray is a middling quarterback, if you ask me. I don't necessarily see a lot of high end upside. He has a lot with his rushing and talents, but as a passer, he's not necessarily the greatest quarterback in the NFL. Is his backup quarterback anywhere close to him? No, Kyler Murray is the guy there. We're talking about Teddy Bridgewater and Drew Locke, and they can't create any kind of separation. If Drew Locke has made that step as a franchise quarterback, you would probably see it in practice. Let's be honest here, guys. No, it's just going to materialize. It's going to, guys, this doesn't count. Everything would just materialize uh, week one of the regular season. And and everyone, remember, preseason games don't count matter. Or, or sorry, yeah, preseason games don't count or matter. Uh, you know, week one or two of the regular season, that won't count or matter because, you know, it's early on. People are still figuring things out. They're getting their feet under them. Really, all September doesn't matter. And then at a point, I don't think October matters. I don't think this whole season matters for luck. I think next season is when it really counts because uh, I think there might be a hole at a, a right tackle. That And if you got a hole on your offense, you can't expect the quarterback to play well. It's just unfair. No. And just real quick, shout out to Michael Ronquillo. I uh, hope everything's going good. Um, have a good night, and we'll everybody. hopefully see you uh, next week or some other night. Just hope everything's going good, Michael. All right. I didn't mean to stir up the beehive, everybody. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. It's good. Hey, we we have had this uh, had this about our show for a long time. Um, we both had very conflicting uh, views about Garrett Bowles last season. And everyone wanted to hate and talk trash on Garrett Bowles. And we were the ones like literally some of the only ones in Broncos country saying Garrett Bowles is going to play at a, yeah. I actually, I put it on tape on this show live that Garrett Bowles is going to play at an all pro level or a pro bowl level, potentially all pro level last season. And 
Sorry. I, I, I hate to thump my chest again on that one, but I was damn right. You deserve it. And I, I want to throw this out there too with uh, Drew Locke and everything is last year, there were a lot of people who are now defending Locke that were sitting there saying, oh, we wish we had Trevor Simeon back. Now, I was not high on Trevor Simeon whatsoever, but I defended Locke through that. So the fact that people call me a hater on Locke just drives me nuts. Yeah. Like, <laughs> all righty, guys, let's let's move away from this. Discussion. And George, yes, actually, we did get in trouble for defending Bulls. Uh, that is my infamous uh, red faced uh, podcast. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's right here. We we, we, got, we, actually, in we got in a <laughs> lot of trouble for that. We really did get in a lot of trouble for that. It was it was bad. I I said curse words on the stream. It was legitimately a, a bad deal. So. And just real quick, before I see a comment in there wanting to compare Garrett Bowles to Drew Locke, situation is Garrett Bowles came into the NFL with only three years total playing football. Drew Locke had a lot more it's than an that in line. just college. Not to mention, offensive linemen do typically take a little bit longer to show it than quarterbacks. Ironically, which is something that it's counterintuitive. Really add up because quarterbacks, you either have it right away or you typically don't. I yeah, yeah I know everyone's been told for about uh, you know eighty years or so that quarterbacks take a while. I know we've all been told this thing. I was told it growing up. Yeah. But the great thing is, we've got data now that says that is total BS. There was a time, there was a time, I guess you could say that time is still now, unfortunately, but there was a time where people thought the world was flat. And then we got data and it was clear that that was not the case. (laughs) I think that's kind of something similar to maybe empirical knowledge, not holding up to scrutiny and maybe we should abandon those old theories. I don't know. I'm a, I'm a wacky, (laughs) I'm a wacky guy. I don't know. Forget about it. What do you guys think about cornerback? (laughs) <laughs> All right, so actually, this, this, this actually has a, this, a great segue here, and it kind of kind of goes into both of them a little bit because David dropped some stars just a second ago asking this question, could our secondary be affecting the quarterback play? Now, Zach, I want to bounce this off of you really fast. Obviously, you're there, and you're seeing it. You're seeing Pat Sertan, who sounds like he's the real deal. Uh, Caden Stern sounds to me like he's showing up really well. Obviously, the secondary is going to be legit this season. Could that be a big part of the process here in evaluating this quarterback competition? Yeah, I think it could. And that's kind of why I was excited to, um, I I guess we'll get a look at it, you know, maybe against that Zimmer second unit, because it Mm -hmm. sounds like, well, I guess, I don't know, the wide receivers were burning that secondary. But to answer the question, yeah, I thought it definitely could have been uh, affecting the quarterback play, especially a Broncos practice, because all the cornerbacks are playing well, like Darby's gotten the least praise out of, you know, probably the starting unit. And even after the scrimmage, he was probably the best cornerback in the scrimmage. And afterwards, Vic Fangio uh, compared him to like a good official, uh, meaning that, you know, you don't really notice a good official, not going to notice a good corner, a good offensive lineman, et cetera. Um, if they're doing their job, you're not noticing them. Uh, so, yeah, I think to answer the question, that's definitely – having an effect on the quarterback competition. But then we hear during these joint practices that the Broncos wide receivers are massacring the Vikings secondary. And uh, it's not like the quarterbacks are lighting it up still. You know, again, some people said Locke won the practice. I think Vikings reporters even said that. So I understand why that gives some people some confidence. But uh, even they, when they clarified their statement, they weren't like, Luck lit the world on fire again. Not to go down the rabbit hole, you know, quick right turn. But uh, yeah, I I think it's having an effect, but I don't think it's having a too big of one because against the Vikings, it didn't seem to change much. Now my thing is, is and we had somebody else ask about the defensive line pressure and everything. And here's my thing with this: is if they are affecting them, then you want the quarterbacks to come up and step up and play better. Because the simple thing is, is you're not going to be playing against other teams as second unit off corners, second unit defenses. So you want to be able to perform iron sharpens iron. iron. That is a saying for a reason. So you want to see them step up against these guys to go out there so they can play first, uh, first unit defenses in the NFL. It's not going to be all easy out there for them, which is why you want them to see this step forward. And it's the concern is, is that, The Broncos quarterbacks, both of them, have struggled against the first unit defense for multiple reasons, and they're doing well against the second unit. So we'll probably see games against easier defenses unless we see a big shift in their performance where they go against the against worse defenses, lesser defenses, I guess would be the better way to put it, and do well. But when they go and face an actual challenge at defense, they struggle. 
Yeah. Like, th- that, this is the issue with the whole, well, what our secondary is so talented. Is it that that's true, but they're going to be facing other talented secondaries and you either rise to the occasion or you, you fade into obscurity. Well, and that was kind of going back to my point about Locke not showing in practice. I mean, there's there's other players in practice that are showing it out. I wrote an article about McTelvin Aguim the other day that, I mean, he's been showing out in practice. Draymond Jones has been showing up in practice, and he's been dominating all, along the interior of the defensive line. Uh, Pat Sertan has shown to be, like, the legit deal. John, uh, I think his name is John Allen. He's the radio broadcaster for the Minnesota Vikings, came on a radio show in Denver earlier today, and they did an interview with him, and they asked – you know, what are the standout players on this Broncos roster that you've seen so far throughout these joint practices? The number one guy he talked about was Pat Sertan. That guy looks like the real freaking deal.com guys. Like be pay attention. Pat Sertan has showed as a rookie through what 12 practices that he is the guy. Like, can I, uh, I want to throw a, I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm feeling, uh, you said I could swear, right? I'm feeling ballsy tonight. I'm, I'm, I'm putting my chips in on the table. Here's my bold prediction. Patrick Sertan, when it's all said and done, uh, will be the best cornerback the Broncos have ever drafted. So that wow. doesn't that, include uh, Chris Harris Jr. Okay. It doesn't right, include Chan no, okay. <laughs> you got But he will be the best one they've ever drafted. You got drafted. the qualifier. You got the Could he pass Chris there. Harris? Absolutely. Champ Bailey, uh, slow down a bit. But best cornerback they've ever drafted, that's pretty good. And people will still. And maybe justifiably so, but people will still be upset about, I mean, we all know, but uh cornerback, am I right guys? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I actually saw a comment. It's one that it's back on quarterback, but I got to grab it from William Daly. And he says, we should stick with Locke throughout the season. It gives time to properly evaluate. And if he fails, at least to a better draft pick next year. And we must invest in the quarterback. Thank you. I actually don't disagree. I, yep. We know what Teddy is playing. Teddy doesn't do you any good. Throw Locke out there. If he's sink or swim. That's what it is. Throw him out there. Let him sink. Let him swim. Let him do whatever. If he fails and you're losing games, you're in a good position to get a quarterback. The only issue with this is if the team around him is able, he plays poorly and the team around him is able to carry him to a decent record season and not quite make the playoffs. And you're in a bad position in the draft spot. That's the yeah. only concern, but that's a concern no matter who you have at quarterback is being carried by a great team around them, but still suffering from bad quarterback play. Yeah. I do think I will say, and I generally speaking, I do agree with that philosophy. I think the Broncos have been bad enough for long enough that there is value in a nine and eight season, just like there was in that Tebow yeah. team that everyone knew was going over. It was an awesome, fun ride, but we all knew that team wasn't winning the Super Bowl at the end mm-hmm. of the day. Um, but there was value in it because it showed Peyton Manning, hey, this team really is a quarterback away. Come here. And maybe that's the Rodgers or Wilson situation, or maybe it's not even, you know, luring a quarterback. Um, but I do think there is some uh, uh, value in putting together a competent yeah. season when you've been uh, uh, bad for long enough. I, I do agree with the premise, though. Give it to Locke. Like, no one, uh, I would hate the idea of Bridgewater being the week one starter, yep. frankly, unless it's like, this competition is so one-sided you're risking losing the locker room. Like if the preseason games go that bad, I'm throwing lock out there. Cause that gives me a chance at like hitting the home run. And if it's so bad and like, I want to keep Vic Fangio's coach or whatever, like let him throw Bridgewater in and like try to win some games. But yeah, definitely start with lock and let him sink or swim. Cause you are praying that, the, the coaching staff should be praying the same thing, you know, we got in the debate about earlier. Like they should be hoping, oh, please just let this be training camp struggles. It's going to materialize once the, the real bullets start firing. Please, 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 please. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. And I, I agree with you that a nine and eight season could do wonders for this locker room, especially if they want to go get a, a quarterback. My, my view on that was strictly more so from a draft perspective of where they fall in the draft. That that's the, that's the negative of it. Oh. So if they don't, if they don't get a veteran quarterback, that's what hurts. Absolutely. And sorry, I lost a train of thought. And then you saying that reminded me, <laughs> I, I absolutely agree with that point, but I do think with this next quarterback class, cause it is, you know, more subpar. I think we all agree there that it could be more like 2019s where you do see some guys go in the teens. Um, you know, Locke of course fell to the second round and I'm praying that guy who goes like 
16th, 17th is Malik Willis, and you can develop that. Yeah. I'm, I'm, Malik, I'm, not, yeah. I'm not a Malik Willis fan right now. I'm just not. I'm I gotta see, I gotta yeah, you see also more. think Mike Mayock and John Gruden make a good combo. <laughs> we don't care about your opinion, Lance. <laughs> Dang, so I, I, have, I, have one, I have one bad take out there. And our, you know what, Ricky? You I what? was high when I said that. Okay. <laughs> I'd argue right, that so, it's only one. Well, but uh, so, since we're talking about it. Uh, well, we're we're at our hour mark. I want to I want to round this out to uh, before we got to get out of here. Zach, I know you had plans tonight, and thank you for sticking with us. We appreciate you, you for guys. coming in, man. Uh, I want to round this out and get out of here uh, on some Minnesota Vikings talk on the Broncos the preseason game here tomorrow at two p.m. Mountain Time. Uh, so there there are some interesting storylines, and I want your thoughts outside of the quarterback position because we've obviously spent way too much time on that. What Zach, are you specifically looking at as your top storyline to watch in the Minnesota Vikings team? Obviously, we're not going to see a lot of the first team except for maybe the offense. Um, second team defense is probably going to see a lot of run. What are you looking at and what are you trying to glean away from this, this first preseason game? Dang, yeah. So, like, obviously there's the quarterback battle, but I'm kind of tired of that. The thing I'm really, ex- like, truly excited to watch, uh, Javante Williams mm-hmm. in, like, live reps because he's looked good in camp, but – as you guys know, it's so hard to evaluate the trenches and the running game in camp. Um, so I'm really excited to see that. That's probably number one on the list. Uh, I think Melvin Gordon's got that starting job locked up, but I would like to see if Javante Williams can push him, put some pressure on him for it. And uh, then behind that, the uh, uh, wide receiver room, uh, specifically those kind of like, uh, I, you know, it might not be the perfect qualification, but like, or classification rather, but those X receivers battling it, battling it out, you know, Devontra's Duke, Seth Williams, Tyree Cleveland. I don't know if he's playing actually. Um, uh, and shoot, there's more because Brendan Mack, even like, I, I kind of forget about him, but he's in the running as well. Um, and then kind of the smaller receivers battling it out between, you know, Spencer, if he ends up playing Hamler hit and et cetera. So, so I, I, I don't disagree with you. And I, I, they're kind of spoiling this article that I just dropped for Mile High Huddle. And I had Javante Williams on there as well. And I also had Trinity Benson and Kendall Hinton. Um, Eric, Benson, yes, thank you. Yep. Uh, Eric, what do you think about guys to watch on the lower end of the roster that could potentially, you know, rise to the top and potentially squeak a roster spot out here? Well, first, I'm, I'm, I'm a trench junkie. I just want to see this defensive line. Uh, I want to see them take over this dominance that they've had in practice from like the first and second units. And I want to see that transition into game time. Um, but anyways, lower guys on the depth chart that I think can rise up. I mean, obviously we've talked about them a couple of times, Trinity Benson and uh, Kendall Hinton. I want to see them and go out perform because this could be a big step for them to try to make this roster. Rogesterman Ferris as well is another one that I think can make this big step forward to try to make this roster spot and kind of going unmentioned a little bit. Levante Bellamy, especially with Mike Boone's injury, missing four yeah. to six weeks. I want to see him step up and push Royce Freeman off the roster. Ooh, ooh, sorry. Uh, okay, so I'm, I'm with you. I would have circled Levante Bellamy going into camp as well. Demarie Crockett, no way in heck I would have ever thought that this would be the guy <laughs> that I'd be fired up about in camp. So good. I think he's been the best running back in camp. It or probably Melvin. Wow. Gordon. It sounds crazy. And probably Javante, like they're better players. I know they are. And like I said, it's so hard to evaluate the running game in camp. But so free, like the first, you know, three or four camps I went to, that guy I kept looking at my roster sheet for wasn't Regester McFair. I was like, that's another good run by 39. Who the heck is running back number 39? <laughs> Demario Crockett. I think he, like, if the Mike Boone thing is serious and it's not Royce Freeman who ends up filling that spot, I think Crockett has a chance. Watch for him in like the third or fourth quarter of the preseason game. I want to see if what I saw in camp was legit. But of those back end guys, Crockett. Buy Crockett stock, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's let's wrap this up here, guys. Uh, Zach, first first things first. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. We really appreciate your time. Appreciate the insight and and your knowledge of of this team inside and out, and uh, everything that you bring bring to the table. Uh, obviously, guys, go check out all of his work at MileHighSports.com, and also at, uh, as a co-host on the Mainly Broncos podcast. Are you? Uh, is that with Cameron Parker? I believe that's yeah, Cameron Parker and uh, Maddie Moles. 
Nice, nice. Uh, I, I need to check that out just a little bit more often. I haven't actually got the chance to do that, but I will definitely focus on that. But guys, we'll we're going to get out of here on uh, the Dove Valley Deep Divers podcast. You guys can follow me on Twitter at Sanderson MHH for Eric at Eric Trickle and for Zach at Zach underscore Seegers. Uh, also, guys, while you're at it, again, follow at DVDD underscore pod. That's the podcast account where you're going to find out what we're talking about every single Friday at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Uh, also, guys, at Mile High Huddle. That's some other account where you're going to find breaking news and analysis on your Denver Broncos, film breakdowns, opinion articles, anything regarding the Broncos. That's where you're going to find it. Uh, Facebook supporters, go to facebook.com slash Mile High Huddle. Click the blue Become a Supporter button. Uh, $5 a month, you're going to get premium content like uh, Kelberman's Corner with Hot Takes That Hold Water. You'll have a Broncos Book Club with Chad Jensen, who was the last I knew was reading through uh, – uh, what's what's that guy's name? I can't remember his name. Uh, it was a, the book about John Elway um, from uh, I, regardless, whatever. Uh, Chad Jensen doing Broncos book club on uh, I think that's Sundays at four. Um, and then also the trickle zone Saturdays at noon. Eric, what do you got going on the trickle zone this week? There's a game tomorrow. I'm going to be previewing the game. OK, sounds good. That sounds, that, 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 <laughs> Uh, obviously, it sounds like a lot of fun. Can't wait to be there. Uh, guys, if you guys are financially able to do so and you really want to help support the show in a, in a great way and help spread the name out uh, non-verbally, head on over to huddleuppod.com. That's the merch booth, guys. I'm a concert junkie, so you understand what merch means to me. Uh, you can get yourself a hat. You can get yourself a T-shirt. I got the Building the Broncos T-shirt on right now. There's a uh, there's a face mask, a coffee cup, a hoodie, anything to suit your fancy, anything for the guys, for the gals. There's a onesie for your baby if that's what you're into. Uh, that's where you're going to get at huddleuppod.com. Uh, if not, guys, uh, the three things you all should be doing at this particular point, we've been doing this for almost two years now. I think we're actually just right at two years, quite honestly. Uh, subscribe. Wherever you guys are watching this podcast, whether it's on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Twitch, doesn't matter, Apple Podcasts, subscribe to Mile High Huddle. Like every video you guys see, especially on YouTube. And if you love it, share it. Share it out to in front of as many Broncos fans as you possibly can because that is the most organic way you can do to uh, help us grow and expand our show. And if it weren't for you guys, we couldn't do what we do best, which is cover your Denver Broncos. Now, with that, guys, Zach, again, thank you very much. Eric, it's always a pl uh, pleasure to be on with you. Before we get out of here, guys, any last works, uh, words? Eric, go first. Yeah, I have a couple. Tommy, I'm, I, I may seem meaner, but I'm actually just a giant teddy bear. He is. Literally, uh, giant teddy bear. <laughs> and then <laughs> um, I got a real quick. I'm trying to find this comment. Um, it was asking about Stephen Tobacco. Any idea when Chad and Zach will be live tomorrow? Being the preseason game is tomorrow. Um, we're actually figuring that out. Tomorrow is scheduled to be Mile High Insiders with Nick and myself joining it since Luke Patterson will be busy. But we are talking about potentially changing that up with Nick and I coming to you on Sunday and letting Chad and Zach take over for the, the post-game wrap-up. So really right now, we just don't know when it'll be. It'll either be either tomorrow or Saturday. Or Sunday, I mean. Yeah, and the only thing uh, I want to plug, you know, obviously, mainly Broncos podcast, check out the writing over at milehighsports.com. And especially, uh, the, I think some people won't like it, but please check out my most recent article, uh, Headlines from the Future. It was a little season prediction piece. I went through the uh, – uh, 2021 season, you know, predicted how the defense will do, how the wide receiver group, and most importantly, uh, how Drew Locke will do. Um, so, uh, uh, it's a little different. It's a little weird. It's the weirdest thing I've ever written, but, uh, uh you know, some people love it. Some people hate it. Uh, check it out and I hope you enjoy it. Yeah. That sounds like a great article. I like quite honestly, I can't wait for this five storylines to watch from this, uh, from, from tomorrow's game to, to, to go live for everyone to check out, but I cannot wait. I'll head on. Uh, my, what is it? Milehighsports.com. Go check that out no, over there. For, yeah. For, for you'll Zach. get a kick out of it. it I took some shots, but you'll, you'll see. You'll enjoy it. <laughs> but this, this ought to be really fun. All right, guys, that's going to do it for us on the Dove Valley Deep, uh, Deep Divers podcast for Zach Seegers, for Eric Trickle. I'm Lance Sanderson. You guys stay safe. Take care. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Go Broncos. As always, we'll see you guys next week. Same time, same place. Game time tomorrow.